So hopefully everybody will be entertained. I know everybody thinks, you know what I really want to do at 5 p.m. is go to a talk that involves math. Uh, so yeah. So hopefully this will. <laughs> Excellent. Came for the math, stay for the mustache. So that's me. We're going to be doing I am Packer and so can you. I'm going to attempt to keep this to the 45-ish minute mark so I can do some Q&A. Hopefully I'll get some, some hard questions. Hopefully I'll get some good questions. All right. Now we're on to the agenda. Um, do a little bit of an intro, talk about the product, or not the product, the project. A little bit about me, because why wouldn't I? I'm up here. Give everybody a little bit of a refresher, kind of techniques, talking a little bit about the PE format, since that's mostly what we're going to be focused on today. Right, we're going to look at the data and we'll pull out our magnifying glass and look at ones and zeros, do a little bit of math. We're going to then look at the solution, and then finally, we're going to look at the results. So, the most important part me, what do I do? Currently, threat research at Bit9 Carbon Black. Uh, right, those are my hobbies static analysis, machine learning. Anybody else from Texas? Yeah. There we go. Uh, if you're in Austin, I will totally buy you a beer. I run a little project and a website called secrepo.com. If you guys are looking for various security data, I try to keep a somewhat updated and curated list. So, everything from kind of bro logs and snort logs to other projects that have way more information than I could possibly host. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, at Sushi. And then finally, I'm a sometimes occasionally contributing member to the MLSec project. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. <laughs> and feel free to tweet about this and use the hashtag securebecausemath, because we are going to be talking about math. All right, so what's the main problem here? So I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the idea of detecting compilers and packers and cryptors and all sorts of other stuff, right? There's some good tools. Some of the tools are really old. So I'm going to pick on PEID here. PEID was written in 2005, right? So in essence, it's 10-year-old technology. Maybe there's a, a more interesting way or a better way to kind of manage this problem. So really the goal was, was set out as, can we do something new and different? So we've got, we've got some goals. So we've got some great projects out there, right, like PEID and some of the other ones. Yeah, they might be a little old, but there's probably still some validity. However, for this, we're going to try and adopt kind of a zero trust towards them. In other words, if somebody as an analyst says, oh, yeah, this PEID signature is verifiably correct, then, then great. We, being myself or anybody else in this room, can, can create a signature and, and kind of directly translate it into this new language. The other one is this easy to create signatures. So looking at PEID and some of the other associated tools, you've got to live in a hex editor, right? You've got to maybe open up IDA and find the exact pattern that you're looking for. It requires kind of a, a certain bar to entry. So the idea here is, can this really be distilled down to something anybody can get value out of, right? So let's make it easy. And we're going we're to talk a little bit about the signatures as well. Cross-platform. So Running PEID on a Mac itself, right, it's a Windows program, that's not going to happen. There are a couple solutions to attempt to let you run PEID signatures on Linux, on Mac. Uh, they're really good. They're not as full-featured as actually using PEID on Windows, so that's kind of a negative there. Um, the other thing, once again, right, simple to extend and understand. So in my opinion, what I'm going to start with here is kind of this, this base notion, this idea, present some data and say, look, I'm pretty sure this mostly works. And then hopefully somebody, multiple somebodies in this room or elsewhere will go, wow, that guy wasn't really dumb. He was only mildly dumb. And instead, here's a couple of enhancements, right? And the other thing that I really wanted to get out of this was this idea of fuzzy matching. So if you've got kind of something like PEID or another signature-based language, generally it's the signature hit or it didn't. So instead, I want to kind of introduce a notion of, well, part of the signature hit, and this is about how much of the signature hit. So in other words, when, when I use this or when anybody else uses this for signature management, you can kind of figure out where your overlap in signatures lie, and, and you can maybe be a little bit more effective kind of out of the gate. So this, we're going to jump in, just an easy refresher. 
talk a little bit about the terms. When I say certain words, what I mean, it might be different from, from what other people set, so I want to make sure to do basic level setting. Talk a little bit about the PE file structure. I'm sure all most of you in this room go home and dream about the PE headers. Uh, probably not everybody does. All right. So this is a very simplified look of the PE file structure, right? You've got kind of this DOS stub at the beginning. You've got these other various headers, some of which are optional, some of which are only generated by certain compilers. You have this notion of sections, right? Some sections contain the code and some contain data and so forth and so on. And this idea of resources, so if you ever look at, you know, an, uh, a programmer executable's icon, it's generally stored in the resource section. So there are many, many different point, parts. This is one of my favorite graphs, and I apologize if you can't see it all that well. These are all the, the header values that you can have in a PE file. Now, keep in mind, not all of them are required to exist. Uh, not all of them are required to be filled out in an entirely accurate way. But this is what you can deal with. So there's a lot of things to mess with. Uh, they're color coded. So really, as far as the PE format itself and the header structure, this is what we're going to care about today. This is the, the three basic things that I decided and whether I'm correct or not, that's fine. But three basic features out of the PE header that I said, these can be kind of interesting, and these should generally vary enough from compiler to compiler or packer to packer or crypto to crypto that they should be useful features in kind of doing this type of analysis. The other one is number of sections. So things like UPX and a lot of other packers, right, maybe they jam the entire executable, and we'll get a little bit more into this in a second, into one section and then just have their little tiny data section. So when I use the phrase tool chain, right, what I'm talking about is the set of tools used to develop software. So you think, have things like IDEs and linkers and compilers and all that kind of stuff. And each one of these actually leaves somewhat of a, a relatively unique fingerprint upon the binary that it creates. Now, once again, you can manually go in and change these. Uh, not a lot of people do. Uh, so for this, we're, we're, when I talk about tool chain, I'm actually going to go, we're going to talk about kind of the build environment. So GCC versus... Visual C++. So packers, what are they? Packers are generally this program within a program. When I want to pack a binary, what I'll do is I can take the original executable, kind of smush it down, and ram it somewhere in, inside this new packed executable. So generally want to do that to evade AV, right? make analyst lives harder, because who loves, or who doesn't love, really, stepping through LED bug? trying to figure out, how do I get the unpacked version of this in memory? Because this is just ridiculous. So at least if you know, if you can identify what packer, if it's similar to anything you've seen before, right, you know what steps you have to go through, or maybe you know what tool to pull out, of your, pull out of your toolbox in order to do the unpacking. So there are really two parts to a packer. Right, you get the packer executable that you run on the original file. This is the thing that actually does the compression or the obfuscation and creates this new executable. And then you've got the unpacker. And the unpacker is generally this little stub that comes out in the new, new program that when this new executable is run, the stub is generally the first thing that is executed. And it goes through and it kind of you know, unpacks the, the original binary and goes, oh, OK, now I'm going to run this. So really, when I talk about packer detection in this context, I'm actually going to be referring to the unpacker or the stub. Right? So unpackers, how do they work? So what you really want to do is you want to take control of the address of the entry point, right? So where, when a Windows or a P file is loaded, where should I go and begin executing code? So you want that to now point to your stub. And then once you, you unpack it, right, so maybe you decrypt it or maybe you deobfuscate it or whatever it is, right, so you find the packed data, you kind of restore it, you get this little in-memory image. Uh, you've got to do a couple relocation fixes because it's not the Windows loader doing the actual loading for execution, you have to mimic some of that. And then you jump into the original program and, and keep going. All right. So now on to the popular kids. So these are kind of the three, in my opinion, and there's probably several more tools that when people do compiler detection or do packer or crypto detection, this is what they're talking about. So PID, I mentioned that one before. It's nice. The sig signature language is pretty good. It's been around forever. It's my opinion, it's kind of the de facto standard. Yara has its own signature language, 
several pro uh, projects that will allow you to take PEID rule sets, convert them to YAR rules, so you can kind of update your analyst tools, uh, but you're still kind of using this limited idea of what it is you're looking at, or this harder way to describe data. Uh, and then this last one, this RDG Packer Detector, I actually really like their slogan. Um, all right, so now, now we're gonna dig into data, and, and who doesn't love data? And honestly, if you're gonna talk about math, and if you're gonna talk about you know, doing any type of analysis, if you don't use data and you don't understand your data, right, it's really, really hard to get good results. And a lot of times, data's really ugly, right? It's not this, this beautiful end result, it's this nasty thing you have to slog through and dissect and understand. So this is the data that I used in my testing setup. So I went and I found and I Googled and I th threw together 3,977 unique PEID signatures. That's a lot of PEID signatures, right? So, so that alone kind of got me thinking, maybe we can address the signature management problem. We got some file sets, various sizes, right? Got smaller ones that, that I understood that I could pull apart and go, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, these two are, are right and this technique seems to be working. And then we have this, this giant random sample at the bottom, right? So 411,000 files. Because everybody loves big data and this wouldn't be a math talk unless I use the phrase big data. So there you go. So that was kind of the, the end all after I, I felt comfortable with the technique and comfortable with the tool, what I ran it over to kind of verify and then did some spot checking with that giant data set. We'll talk about that as well. So let's get into some of the data analysis, right? So for this, there's a handful of slides, we'll go through them. We're gonna talk about the basic exploration of the Zeus data set, right? So if I go back a slide, I think, yeah, there we go, right? So 6,700 samples roughly is, is what these slides are based off of. Uh, there we go. Okay, so first thing I did was, all right, what happens if I run PID on these 6,700 files? Well, turns out PID signatures don't match 4,600 of them. Really disappointing. So you get some other ones, right? So this different UPX and another UPX version and you know, my Microsoft uh, Visual Basic and Armadillo Packer, which I'm sure just by looking at the numbers, you could probably make a relatively educated guess that maybe Microsoft Visual Basic 5.0 and 6.0 and Armadillo Packer are really, really closely related. So what is the, kind of those numbers, what do they look like in a visual format? It's a bar chart. You don't have to worry about the numbers. That really tall line is the 4600. So this is kind of another way to visualize it, right? Just to kind of get into the idea that creating signatures is, is hard, right? It's not, it's not trivial. So having an easier way to do it would be great because then that really big giant, and I apologize for not using grayscale, blue box or bluish purplish box, to make that smaller, right? To, to get more things that you can actually label and understand. Okay, cool. So this graph, in, in my opinion, is, is what science looks like, right? You show this to somebody and they're gonna go, that dude up there totally did science. <laughs> so this is simply a correlation matrix. And the idea being is you take all of these PEID signatures and for files that had multiple PEID signatures flag, you wanna see which signatures flagged, right, with a high correlation or flagged, uh, when one flagged, the other one was, was very, very likely to flag. So the diagonal is basically the signature correlating with itself, which makes sense, right, because every time a signature file fires, it's gonna be observed. So with this, you kind of wanna pull out the, the little black dots. And while this one's kinda of hard to, to view, we can zoom in on one little snippet of the graph. So this is kind of that upper left-hand corner and you can see that there are a couple signatures that are highly, highly correlated, right? So there's a lot of signature overlap. There could be signature overlap, right? In your environments, there's obviously signature overlap on the stuff I downloaded from the internet, right? So every time, you know, one of these AS pack uh, signatures flagged, the other one did. And so with that, you can kind of get a feel for, oh, this is, this is where I'm lacking, or this is maybe where I have some duplication. So that's great, we've got we understand what, what PID looks like in a sample data set. So now looking at maybe some of the other features that we can use in addition to the header features that may allow us to definitively say or say with a very high probability that we're looking at a, you know, a specific packer or a specific compiler. So we can use PDB strings. 
I love it when any type of malware author or any author in general includes a PDB string because sometimes it's like hitting gold. Sometimes they're awesome, right? And they're like, oh yeah, by the way, we're using the, this crypto called Crypto Evolution, right? And it was, it's our visual C++ project. Sometimes, you know, it's kind of random garbage and doesn't really give you anything. It's important to keep in mind that these are just text, right? So there's no reason why you can't create your own. So for misinformation strategy, right? So now I kind of mentioned this, this linker version. So you've got these major and minor linkers. What do they look like in the sample set? So this is just kind of breaking down. So if you've got the first one, right, linker 2.5, 2,000 of them. So while you can, you can group you know, this Zeus sample set or many other sample sets just by looking at the number of linker versions, or the, sorry, looking at the linker versions in their count, it still really doesn't tell you the whole story. So we looked at number of sections, and you can kind of see a relatively similar distribution, right? You've got a couple really, really big groups of files, right, that might indicate a specific campaign or something like that within the Zeus data set, and you kind of have this longer tail. So the thing we really wanted to look at, assembly mnemonics. So I think these are kind of cool. So the idea here is, right, when an executable runs, there's code, and that code, those bytes, can be translated into a mnemonic. And all the mnemonic is is simply, instead of, right, the byte representation for add, it just prints out the word add. And it's easier for me and a lot of other people to understand. So the idea is maybe we can use assembly mnemonics to help understand exactly what it is they're looking at. Right, and Johnny Five's alive, but in order to get assembly mnemonics, you must disassemble. So, <laughs> sorry, Johnny. So for this, Capstone Engine was used. I don't know if anybody's played with Capstone Engine. If you're looking for a free and a really awesome uh, disassembler, it's great. I love it. Runs on multiple architectures. There's bindings for multiple languages. It's super easy to use. So the reason I call this out specifically is I'm sure a lot of you have noticed that every single time you run a different disassembler on an executable or some code, you will get different results, right? So really, you only get consistency within a disassembling engine. So if you were to write your own or use one of the other disassemble libraries, the technique itself would still work, and, and that's totally cool, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not pimping completely Capstone Engine. I like it a lot. But uh, the point is, is just to be consistent with this type of stuff. So then I had what I thought was a really bright idea. I was going to look at the correlation between assembly mnemonics, right? So every time an ad appears, how likely is it that a move or maybe a call or a jump also appears? Yeah, that was an awful idea. So we moved on. So now let's get into some of the math, right? Because how do you not love math? Math is so fantastic. So going back to kind of the assembly mnemonics, right, these mnemonics describe the program behavior, and that's kind of what we're looking to capture is what exactly is this unpacker doing, or how exactly does the executable get set up, right, because it's generally compiler-specific, specific, or in the case of a packer or a cryptor, right, they have to know what to undo so they can then run whatever code they want. So we want to kind of capture this, this program behavior, and that's what we're doing with the assembly mnemonics. So, you know, how can we look at, look at these various, you know, assembly mnemonics? So we looked at correlation. Correlation doesn't really take order into account. You saw the correlation matrix. It looked ridiculous. Right, so imagine looking at that for 400,000 samples. It's just going to be some massive gray blob, and you're going to go blind and be sad. So, you know, there's this kind of notion of, of distance or similarity, that, that fuzzy idea is if I have a signature, I want to know how close what I'm looking at is, is how close is it to the signature, right? How similar are two things, this idea of similarity. So we'll talk a little bit about Jacquard distance. Jacquard's awesome, it's cool, however, it doesn't take order into account. The idea being that with assembly, right, it executes an order. It doesn't, it doesn't jump around. I mean, there's, there's you know, uh, flow control and all that other kind of stuff, but generally, you know, if you see an add, a move, and an XOR, they'll be executed in that order and not, you know, move XOR add or, or vice versa. So while Jacquard's great and, and it might be useful, order I thought was, was pretty important to take into account. So there's this idea of Levenstein distance. There's another cool distance metric. The number of edits determine the distance, and position is important. So let's look at one of the examples of Jacquard distance. So here we have two 
uh, seemingly random uh, just sets of assembly mnemonics, right? So we can say the leftmost is the one at the edges of uh, entry point, so this is where the executable will start, and then it moves from left to right. And you can see there's various ones. So the easy way to view of, of computing Levin, or uh, sorry, Jacquard distance is to take the total number of shared elements, divide it by the total number of unique elements, and that's your distance. So in this case, it's move push, which is two, divided by the other set, right, which is eight, and you get 0.25. So as far as set membership is concerned, these two things are, you know, have a distance of 0.25. And, and while okay, um, and I just didn't quite feel right. So with Levenstein, once again, you have this idea of order. So how many things have to change to make one into the other? So this kind of fit the, the dom domain a little bit better. So once again, kind of just doing a quick compare, uh, you know, looking at if they're different. So right, there's one difference, and then they're not different, and so forth and so on. So basically seven changes are necessary to make one set into the other set. Therefore, we get a distance of seven. So kind of what we were talking about before. But code is executed in order. There may be branches. I really didn't want to build any type of you know, flow graph or any of that kind of stuff. I wanted to keep it simple and understandable and efficient. So in theory, the, the assumption was, and what I worked with was, the assembly mnemonics to the left should be more than the assembly mnemonics on the right, right? Because it will execute starting on the left, and it will finish somewhere off the right. And if there's a jump in there, Maybe I want to care about it, but maybe I don't really want to care about this stuff after as much as the fact that there was the jump. So there were a bunch of, of testing and metrics where I tried to figure out you know, where the cutoff was, how many assembly mnemonics were required, so forth and so on, and we'll get into that. Right? We, have, we also have to take into account how big is the stub, and if you don't know what you're looking at, then you don't know what you're looking at, and some of these questions are really hard to answer. So we turn to tapered leverage team. And this, I think, is a really, really cool algorithm. So basically the idea is it's position dependent like regular Levin says, except the, late, the ones on the left, right, any edit to the left will have a higher weight than an edit to the right, which kind of makes sense. So this is kind of a way to capture. Now we have, oh, we care about more of the things that are executed first in case there's something like a, a branch or a jump, right? And now we have a language, this assembly mnemonics, to kind of capture program behavior. So we can put those two together, and the way you, you basically calculate this for every single position is one minus the position of, of the thing you're looking at, right, divided by the length of the set. So in this case, there's 10 things in the set. So the first thing, right, requires one full edit. The second thing requires zero edits. And the third thing requires, right, 0.8 of an edit. So you kind of go on, and now you have a distance of 3.5. So to me, this was great because it said, yeah, these things are, are separate and, and different, but there might be some some sort of similarities. The nice thing you can also do with Levenstein is you can actually use it as a similarity uh, calculation, right? So if you want to use it as a similarity, so it says basically those two sets are 65% similar. So this is how the idea of, of saying, oh, we get this fuzzy hashing, this kind of idea of similarity mixed into the algorithm. All right. So now that we've, we've made it kind of through this great refresher, uh, everybody loves P, you know, files and their headers and all the various values, and we have an idea of the features we're going to look at, right, what we're going to use, so we're going to use the major linker version, the minor linker version, these various assembly mnemonics, right, number of sections. We have some really fancy sounding algorithms that are actually really simple to understand, which is great. We have a way to do fuzzy matching. Awesome. So what do we do? Well, first step, gather samples. We already talked about the data sets. So you know there are well over 411,000 samples that we dealt with. So the second thing was, right, let's get PEID, kind of this industry standard, this thing that I'm very comfortable with, I've used a lot in the past. Let's see what it, it looks like for everything. Then from there, for every single one of the, uh, the executables, we're going to disassemble them, right, because we need the assembly mnemonics, and in this case, we wound up using the first 30 assembly mnemonics. Let me get the header features. We'll talk a little bit about clustering so you can kind of understand which PE files are similar based on these three features, right? Assembly mnemonics, the various header features. Then when I ran this across all the data sets, my, cut, my threshold was this 90% similar. So I felt that if 
an executable's signature and a signature that I was matching against were not at least 90% similar. I felt that wasn't good enough to call it a, an actual match. So one of the things that I started off using was banded minhash. It's a similarity comparison optimization because I didn't feel like doing uh, big O right, of n squared comparisons, especially on 400,000 things. Uh, however, the implementation of banded minhash that I was using was broken, so I wound up doing a lot of comparisons. But luckily not by hand. All right, then we created signatures so we could test and uh, verify. So one of the things that I, I kind of want to talk about briefly is why signatures, right? So everybody, we live in this, this great age where it's like, oh my god, security data science, we have to do supervised machine learning, and if we're not using random forest or if run, you know, unsupervised, if we're not using TB scan or k-means, you know, with the k-means optimization, you just like no, 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 no. Sometimes it's overkill, right? So one of the nice things about signatures in this case is we can use it to capture kind of this domain-specific language, but me or anybody else, we don't have to worry about model drift, right? So after you create this awesome machine learning model that might have great accuracy, what happens when you get new data and you go to train it, right? that accuracy begins to drift, the model kind of gets out of whack, so to speak, and you've got to keep going through this, this large process, right? This is one of the issues with oper uh, operationalizing machine learning. But also, the model will vary based on training source, right? So if I trained it against only my APT1 set, well, then it would be really good at probably finding things labeled APT1, but it would be worse about trying to determine which packer or which cryptor is, is what, right? And likely, everybody else will have different data than me, so it really wasn't a good fit. And kind of that last bullet is really where I was going is simple, right? You want to play. You want to do things. You want to tinker. Sometimes machine learning is fun to tinker with. Sometimes you really just want to get something done. So here's kind of what the, the signature language itself looks like. So really, really simple. Uh, it's kind of highlighted to show you the signature, and I'm going to go into a demo in a second. But so the signature for Microsoft Visual Basic is the top line, and then the parts where it matched on the file. So you can kind of see those, those blue highlighter regions. There's quite a few. The ones on the left, there's a really long run. Right? So you get the similarity of, of 0.902, right? because it required 2.9 through repeating edits. So in my opinion, I think that, that accurately captured, yeah, this signature is relatively simple to the file, and I feel pretty confident that this file matches my signature. All right, now let's move into a demo. Oh, God. Um, I'm going, let me minimize that real quick. Doo -doo -doo. All right, I think we should be good. I think I broke everything. That's phenomenal. I yeah, seriously. All right. Oh. <laughs> uh. I just, <laughs> this, this is what I get for doing trying to do like an honest to god demo, huh? Maybe if I don't do it in full screen. Eh, we can figure it out. There we go. It just hates full screen. So I'm going <laughs> to, Asian guy showed up. Awesome. It went from friendly math talk to clan rally kind of quickly. I apologize. So I, I scripted this out because I was, I was kind of a chicken as well. Uh, I didn't want to type commands, and quite frankly, watching me type commands is boring. So I'll direct your attention to the top kind of small box and walk through the demo. Oh, God. All right. This really is. I apologize. Um, you know what? Hold on. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta get back up here. Yeah, just sit there for it, like like two minutes. <laughs> gotta want it. Oh man. <laughs> That's all right. If it doesn't work, I have slides. But I thought a demo would be way more entertaining for everybody.
All right, third time's a charm. No. Nope, third, yeah, third time was not a charm. When in doubt, try a different port. Oh, maybe that's awesome if that was the case. All right. Oh. I really didn't want to like try and lean over. You know what? Screw it. I'm gonna unplug one more time. We're just gonna go back to the presentation. And if anybody wants to actually see a demo, I promise it. I literally promise it works. I, I, I swear. I don't promise it. <laughs> uh, do, do, do. Oh, no, no, no. I was trying to make sure that. I think we're good. All right. We good? All right. Screw you, demo gods. Now you get unre like completely unreadable slides. So I'll try to describe what's going on. There's two phases to this. One, there's the signature generation phase, and that simply says, Run this one script on a binary that I can't even show on a computer. That's what I get for trying to do a demo. And generate the signature. And all the signature is going to be is a simple list, is, list of assembly mnemonics and then give you this major, minor, linker version and then as well as the number of sections. And then all you have to do, if you're not giving a demo, is run this other script that if you can see it that mmpes.py on the signature, and you can do all sorts of things. You can give it a threshold. So if, if your idea for similarity is different than mine, right, if you say, I want to know everything that's 50% similar, you can do that. You can give it this crazy verbose to where it says, all right, here's the signature that I have, and here's what I'm matching against. You can do that in case you really want to interrogate everything. It also tells you when the major and minor linker versions match, or when they don't match, or when the number of sections don't match. Right, it tells you how many edits you have and then the actual similarity. So this was actually between two APT1 samples. And you can kind of see the signature generated on the two files in this directory. The first one really didn't match all that well. Right? It had this, this 0.844, uh, required you know, roughly four and a half edits. But then this other file, right, it, it matched exactly. So all 30 assembly mnemonics were perfectly in order. Both the uh, major and minor linker numbers matched, as well as the number of sections. And here's kind of a, a better description of the rule that you guys might be able to see. All right. Apologies for the demo. So let's look at some of the data sets. We'll actually look at some of the bigger ones, because again, big data. So we'll start with the APT1. So for here, this is kind of describing the clusters, so in other words, the like things grouped with other like things. And it's two bar charts superimposed on one another, which is why you get the color variations. Once again, apologies for not doing it in grayscale. So that very you know, far one on the right, the idea is PID found in that yellow thing and said, this many things are similar. And then kind of that green bar is the assembly mnemonic comparison of this many things were similar. So kind of the cool thing, even with having zero trust in the labels of using something like PEID, right, you get kind of this anticipated view. You expect a lot of things to kind of fall into to a few buckets, and then you get this really long tail that, as an analyst, is always a pain in the ass to deal with. So one of the other ways you can represent this is kind of these neat-looking bubble graphs, right? It's not, not really science unless you have sweet graphs. So this is just clustered on assembly mnemonics. So once again, kind of representing what you could see, this one really large cluster and kind of these other ones. But the signature language and, and this work revolved around a couple other features. So what do they look like? All right. So the darker blue is the actual, is the group. So in this case, it's that big orange one is the big dark blue one. And then within that one cluster, right, based only on assembly mnemonic similarity, you now have kind of these three subclusters based on number of sections. And so this is kind of interesting, right? There's maybe a, a little bit of variation, so maybe somebody used a slightly different version of something, so forth and so on. Likewise with linker versions, I thought this was kind of neat. There's you know, very little in this sample set. Uh, deviation for linker versions 
when used as a subclustering. And so then this is kind of uh, a three-dimensional or two-dimensional view of a three-dimensional set of features. So once again, kind of that, that dark blue is the assembly mnemonic circle, and then you've got these various sub-circles. Um, kind of the one on the lower right-hand corner, you can see the cluster, and then you can see one cluster that was actually based off of a number of sections, and you can kind of see two sub-clusters in that, and then everything else only had that one cluster. So it's kind of cool. So let's look at Zeus. Much bigger data set, much bigger graphs, much more science. So this is what Zeus looked like. And once again, kind of earlier with the little teaser, you get this massive, massive, massive PID unknown label. Uh, but the cluster one, it actually, it breaks it up. So this one and the stacked one, you can see the assembly amount of clustering on that, that yellow graph or the yellow bar kind of in that blown up window is a little bit more manageable. And you kind of get this slightly more gentle sloping curve. Uh, but you get a lot of bubbles. <laughs> so either the, the end result is I shouldn't do anything in D3, or you should never D3 while, high, while you're high, because <laughs> both scenarios end badly. So once again, what does it look like if we subcluster on a number of sections, right, versus the, the cluster, the initial cluster on assembly mnemonics? You get more circles. Well, what if we do it on linker version? You get these, these crazy sub-spirals, like things look so bizarre. Um, this was, for me, it was kind of enjoyable because it was a really neat exploration of, of Zeus and kind of a way to visualize this entire data set. And then when you subcluster on both, you just kind of want to go home and cry. <laughs> it's never very good. All right. So I mentioned that I did something on 411,000 files, which was awesome, so let's talk about them. All right, this is, this is just the assembly mnemonic graph. So you can see there are tons of, of clusters based on, you know, right, these similarity based on assembly mnemonics. This is awful to read. So one of the fun facts about this is roughly 5,800, right, out of these 411,000 files are not 90% similar to any other file of this, in this entire corpus. I thought that was really cool and really surprising. So this might be some, some polymorphic stuff, right? It might be various cryptors, who knows? But it was cool. Uh, 5,800 things is way too many for me to actually dig through. Right, so we'll kind of skip through some of these. Everybody loves spirals and I really wanted to leave 15 minutes for questions. So don't D3, or I shouldn't D3. I actually broke D3 on one of these. It just my nested JSON was too big and it, it just wouldn't work. So once again, subcluster number sections, and this is the one that I broke. So this is where D3 just simply said, I, I give up. Or, or you're doing it really wrong. And it might very well be that I was doing it really wrong, but uh, it cried. So there were a couple of really, really cool things though that popped out of this relatively large data set. Like Google Chrome. There were 97 Google Chrome instances, right, hashes in this 411,000, and they all matched the same signature, right? They all had this kind of same assembly mnemonic string. And so they're very consistent with their builds at Google. So if anybody's in the room from Google, thanks. Appreciate that. Right, they're very consistent with what linkers they have, right, what linkers they use. So out of the 97, kind of the take home is, 94 of those 97 have matching linker versions, matching number of sections, and assembly mnemonics within 90%, right, this 0.9 distance. So that was kind of cool. And then it really wouldn't be a talk about Packers if I didn't talk about UPX, because somebody was going to ask about it. So this, this was kind of cool, this was kind of telling. Uh, I dug into to UPX some in the past, but this actually forced me to do a little bit more digging. So I kind of cheated and I said, all right, what if I do this really, really naively, thanks, and just look for the string, right, UPX0, UPX1, or UPX bang in the file and said, eh, it's probably UPX, right? Because once again, I didn't want to test any prior solution and I wanted to really see how this kind of stuff stacked up. So with, with the assembly mnemonics, right, 
out of just doing that simple thing through it, it got 65 different groups. And I thought, shit, now I'm going to be laughed off stage. However, there's some pretty cool results in here. So you can kind of see in the table, there's this group label and there's this count. So that's the group label or the cluster label is just the arbitrary number that I assigned to it, this group. So you can kind of see once again, you get this, this neat little slope. And I was like, all right, so maybe, maybe there's some variations of UPX. Maybe I'm, I'm much smarter than I thought I was and I can do UPX version detection with this, right? Maybe my head's going to explode uh, or maybe I, I failed miserably. And the answer is kind of somewhere in between. So looking up against how it stacked up against PEID, while I didn't trust the PEID results fully, uh, it was neat to say either you know, me or, and or every random person that I pulled signatures from on the internet were making the same mistakes or maybe we're totally onto something. So kind of the cool thing was, is here's the numbers, it looks like you know, maybe I was onto something after all. There's also kind of that none, I dug through that a little bit to see what was going on and, and if this algorithm was completely failing. It turns out there's a bunch of packers that basically wrap UPX uh, which I really hadn't had much exposure to, so I thought that was awesome. So I learned a whole bunch there, um, these kind of variations. So, right, let's go through this recap. The idea was easy to generate signatures. Had I had a working demo, you would have literally seen me type one command and the signature would have appeared out of nowhere. It would have been awesome. But I can show you later, I'm happy to. It involves math, right? Who doesn't love math? It's cross-platform. It's all written in Python because Python's the new old Ruby. Uses Capstone Engine. It's cross-platform. It met that requirement. It's mostly easy to understand. It involves a little bit of math, but hopefully not too bad even for 5 o'clock on a Friday. And probably most important for me is, is it works. So uh, even though the paper promised the demo and didn't work, I'm going to release it online. Um, the guys at work were more than happy to say, yeah, you can totally release this tool and some sample signatures for people to play with and, and use. That's the URL where it and these slides will live, the updated slides, because the old ones are on the CD. So feel free to take a picture of it, or you can ping me on Twitter. However, it's not up there yet, because I'm a slacker, so it'll probably get done next week. And last but not least, if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Question. Yeah. So the answer is, once you have all of this data, uh, what's the action? And that's actually a really good question. So aside from, from why did I do it, because I love messing with things, uh, it's important in my opinion for any analysis to drive an action, and the action is to understand what it is you're looking at as you know, a malware reverser or somebody looking for extra context, right? So if, if I can kind of help solve part of the signature management problem and you can get this idea of, of fuzzy matching out of signatures and whatnot and have fairly accurate signatures with very little low lift, right, when you're at your home organization and you've got, man, I've got this piece of malware that I've never seen and you go grab 3,900 signatures off the internet, right, you can go, oh, right, here's, here's a technique that uses these types of signatures that works that tells me how similar it is to some of these other things that other people have seen. So it kind of helps give you a, a starting point for analysis. Any more? Okay. Yeah. What's your thought on the uh, IEEE standard? The IEEE what? Um, honestly, I haven't looked at it much, so I don't really know if I have a, a good opinion on it. Sorry. <laughs> Any more? Oh, uh, I mean, it'd be awesome. Would Would you believe it? Oh, if anyone's using it, I haven't run into it. Uh, so the question was, have I run into anybody actually putting in the packer information into the packing, uh, the packed files? My answer is no, because I didn't run into it in, in any of my sample sets. However, uh, even at 410 or 411,000 binaries, given the number of executables that everybody talks about, right, that's still a relatively small sample set, so it's, it's nowhere near everything. Any more? Uh, another question? Yep. So does this apply to protectors as well, or am I using packers in a broad side? Yeah. When I say packer, I mean protectors, cryptors, the, the whole gamut, the whole idea that it's, you want to obfuscate some intellectual property or something in a binary and make it hard for someone to, to get the juicy bits. 
anymore. Man, was my math that much on point that not everybody fell asleep and nobody has questions on math? All right, cool. So I'll be around if everybody has questions. Oh, sorry, one more. <laughs> How do I make this mustache happen? It, I think it is genetics. Uh, it is math. This is what happens when you do too much math. You wear super classy. Sh <laughs> this is. I do. Yeah. So I actually had a really long beard at one point in time, and my my wife hated my long beard because I told her I was going for wizard length. So I said, you know, if I can have a long beard, I'm going to have a long mustache. Now I sleep on the couch. <laughs> too, much D3. <laughs> too much, too much D three. Exactly. All right. Any more questions? Nobody. All right. Cool. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it.